a number of years ago, when we still, until recently, had the uh, old wood siding on the exterior of our church building, a number of years ago, that wood desperately needed a new coat of paint. Money was tight, but we finally found a painter who was willing to do it at bargain basement prices, so we said, okay. It turns out this painter was able to offer us such good prices because he was systematically thinning his paint with turpentine. We probably never would have known that, but for the fact that one day when he was out there painting, there was a sudden unexpected downpour and the rain beating against the side of the building, the paint not yet dry caused the thin paint to run in obvious ways. I was so furious when I figured out what was going on. I went out to confront him. Now, you have to understand that this was back before I had significant dental work done and still spoke with a pronounced lisp. So I walked up to him, looked him in the eye, and I said, repaint and thin no more. You get it, right? I meant to say repent and sin no more, but it came out, repaint and thin no more. Okay. So we're off to a good start. Building on that momentum, our word for today is repent. We're in the midst of a sermon series where we're studying the major themes embedded in the teachings of Jesus. If Jesus is Lord, if Jesus is Savior, it's imperative that we understand what he came to teach us. The Gospel of Mark tells us that Jesus began his ministry this way, Mark 1.14. Now, after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So from the very beginning, this concept of repentance has been at the heart of the gospel message. Except you repent, Jesus said elsewhere, Luke 13, 3, you will all likewise perish. In other words, repentance is somehow essential to our salvation. But how? Why? Why is repentance so important, and what does it really mean? Let's start with a prayer. Jesus, light of the world, we really do want to understand what you came to teach. So please, help us today to come to understand better, better than ever before, so that we can live in your light and share that light with others. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. The New Testament concept of repentance is, I would submit, profoundly misunderstood. Most people think that repentance means behavioral self-reformation. The typical example that preachers often give who take this perspective, they say, imagine that you're walking down a street in this direction when you suddenly realize that you're going in the wrong direction. So you stop, you turn around, and you walk in the opposite direction. I saw a, a, a meme online the other day that said, I checked myself into the hokey pokey clinic and turned myself around. That is the popular, the conventional notion of this concept of repentance. The idea that if you want to be in relationship with God, you got to clean yourself up and turn yourself around. And at first blush, that sounds... Logical, the problem is that way of being creates all kinds of spiritual dysfunction. 
Ingrid was a, a friend of mine at a church I attended some 30 years ago. She was a wonderful person, but struggled mightily with mental and emotional health issues that she traced all the way back to her childhood. Nothing she ever did was good enough for her mother. Her mother expected perfection, but perfection is an unattainable ideal. The the anxiety of never being able to do anything right in the eyes of her mother really did a number on Ingrid, so much so that even as an adult, even in her relationship with God, she lived with this constant nagging sense that nothing I ever do is going to be good enough for God and I deserve to be punished. When I was in uh, first grade, at Acton Elementary School, out on the playground at recess at the swing set one day, I had an altercation with this other little boy. I don't remember now what the altercation was about. I just remember that he looked at me and said, I'm going to tell Miss Byfield. Now, Miss Byfield was the meanest teacher in the elementary school. She was in the habit of doing laps around the school. We had a little red brick school building back then, and she would walk laps around the school building on patrol just looking for some kid that was breaking a rule so that she could punish them. I'm sure she was a sadist at heart. So <laughs> when this little boy said to me, I'm going to tell on you to Miss Byfield, I panicked. I immediately surveyed the territory. I ascertained that Miss Byfield had just rounded the northwest corner of the building. So I immediately made a beeline to the southwest corner of the building, the opposite corner, and I waited there peering around the corner until she rounded the next corner, and then I went on to the next end and peered around the corner until she rounded the next corner, so on and so forth, throughout the entire recess on the lamb, keeping a whole building side ahead of Miss Byfield until finally I was saved by the bell. God bless and keep Miss Byfield far away from us. <laughs> Many of us, consciously or subconsciously, have learned to think of God as being some kind of a cross between Ingrid's mother, nothing you do is ever good enough, and Ms. Byfield, I would just as soon punish you as look at you. And if that's what God is like, if God is this exacting, punishing figure who demands a level of perfection in our behavior, then I suppose there are only three possible ways we can respond to that. Each of these three ways being equally spiritually dysfunctional. And so today as we run through these three dysfunctional ways of approaching God that come from this understanding of repentance as self-reformation, ask yourself, which of these three ways of being spiritually dysfunctional am I most apt to fall into given how I'm put together and my experience and background. If God is an exacting, punishing figure who demands perfection, one way to respond, option one, is to push as far away from God as you can possibly get and pretend you don't care. You can adopt my Ms. Byfield strategy. Get as far away from God as is humanly possible. Why even bother? I don't really care anyway. Option one. Many of us have spent a portion of our spiritual journeys pursuing option one. Option two is to try but fail. So you try again and you fail again. So you say to yourself like Ingrid, what's wrong with me? Why can I never get this right? Maybe if I just try harder. So you try again, and you fail again, 
And before long, you are caught in this cycle of, of trying and failing and an ever-growing sense of shame and guilt that is a heavy burden on your shoulders. Sky Jathini, in his ministry with college students in Christian fellowship groups, says, I've begun to discover that so many young adults in our culture today who've been raised in the churches of our culture today are living with this abiding sense that God is extremely disappointed with me. That's a terrible way to live. But there is a way to avoid that. If you don't want to run away from God, option one, and you don't want to live trapped in this constant cycle of trying and failing, guilt and shame, there is option three. Convince yourself that you're perfect. <laughs> Pretend to yourself, God and others, that you are a saintly, godly, model believer who is consistently living up to the standards of God, not out of a sense of spiritual pride, but because you are desperate to please a God whose love for you is conditioned on model behavior. Many of us, consciously or subconsciously, have learned to think that way. And so we try really hard to be as perfect as we can possibly be. And that, the problem with that way of living is that it turns out to be really stressful. Just ask me, I know, because option number three has been my preferred spiritual dysfunctional way of being. You see, I grew up in fundamentalist Baptist churches, and we had exacting standards for holy behavior. And I really wanted to be holy because I wanted God to love me. The story that I'm going to tell you is kind of embarrassing, but on a Sunday when we're talking about not pretending... I guess I should tell an embarrassing story about myself. When I was in middle school, at gym class one day, our gym teacher took us out to the track and field area. He decided that we were all going to run 100-yard dashes, and he was going to time us with his stopwatch. And so he divided us into groups of three, and, and then he went to the other, Mr. Schumann went to the other end of the track with his stopwatch, and he would say, ready, set, go, in the first group of three. We'd go racing down the track, and, and then, ready, set, go, the next group of three. So as I was at the opposite end of the track, standing and waiting with my group of three for our turn to go, I had a problem. I had gas. <laughs> now, being a good Baptist boy, I couldn't just fart. <laughs> because you see, we Baptists have our standards. And farting is not part of the protocol. Now you may say, Jeff, farting is not a moral issue, it's just a natural bodily function. That may be the case, but it was not part of our model for good Christian behavior. So here I was at the end of the track, getting ready to run a hundred yard dash in front of all my friends with a gut full of gas. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> our turn finally comes and Mr. Schumann says, ready, get set. Go, and we are off. I'm running as fast as I can because I want to get as good a time as I can. And I'm managing to hold it all in even as I'm racing down the track. It was going beautifully. It was going perfectly until I gave that final last push to get across the finish line when I lost control. And as I ran across the finish line with all of my friends and classmates standing there, I was farting right and left. <laughs> They all laughed. I was mortified. <laughs> and all Mr. Schumann said was, Minor, if you had done that at the other end of the track, you would have had a better time. <laughs> Many people think that repentance means behavioral self-repentance. 
reformation. And so we try to pretend to be somebody we're not, trying to pretend to live up to standards that no one can ever meet. And so we try to hold inside all of our bad impulses. We try really hard, but inevitably the stink comes out. <laughs> and then we either get discouraged and quit, or we choose to live in denial. That, uh, that selfish thing that I just did, oh, it, it wasn't really selfish because if I acknowledge to myself, and God and others, that it was selfish, then God won't love me anymore and I won't be able to feel good about myself. So, so somehow I've got to rationalize in my mind that that selfish thing that I did, it really wasn't selfish. After all, in fact, I had perfectly good and pure motives, so now I can feel good about myself and now I can believe that God loves me. But, but the problem is when you do, when you live that way, when you live in denial, you start to get into, uh, you get to really good and rationalization. And so before long, everything, that you do wrong it's, it's like it can't be wrong it's got to be good because after all I'm a follower of Jesus and I got to be perfect and I'm going to be a follower of Jesus so you rationalize it and so you end up doing lots of bad things but rationalizing that they're good things so you can feel good about yourself talk about a stressful way of living Reinhold Niebuhr once put it this way he said most of the evil in the world does not come from evil people it comes from people who consider themselves good if salvation requires repentance and if repentance means behavioral self-reformation then there are only three possible ways to respond, each equally dysfunctional. Which of these three ways that we've covered are you most apt to stumble into? Option one, pushing away from God and pretending not to care. Or option two, trying to reform and fail, try again and fail, repeating that pattern with mounting guilt and shame. Or option three, pretending to be perfect or at least close thereto. The tragedy of each of these three ways of being is that none of them allows us to have an authentic relationship with God or even with ourselves. There must be a better way. And there is. Because you see, the New Testament concept of repentance, it turns out, is not about self Reformation. The New Testament Greek word for repentance is metonia. Metonia means a change of mind, thinking a new way, as when facing a new direction and gaining a new perspective. So repentance is about how we think, not about how we behave. Jesus came to call us to a whole new way of thinking. What does that new way of thinking, that metanoia way of thinking look like? In our gospel passage that you heard Sandra read a little bit earlier, Jesus gives us a graphic example of this change of mind that he came to call us to. Luke chapter 18, verse 10, Jesus says two people, he's telling a parable about two people who have very different ways of seeing God and themselves. Two people went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. Of the three dysfunctional ways of being spiritually that we just covered, which one was this Pharisee falling into? He was clearly an option three kind of guy, striving to convince himself, God and others, that he was perfect. Usually when people read the words of this Pharisee interpretatively, usually people will give him a tone of condescension and moral superiority, but I see it differently, perhaps because I can relate to this guy, because option three is my go-to way of being spiritually dysfunctional. I suspect this, this Pharisee's prayer was genuine and sincere. Because he'd always been taught that if God's going to love him, if he's going to be right with God, he can't be like other people. He's got to be better than them. 
So when he prays here, I hear him sincerely saying, God, thank you that I'm not like other people because otherwise I couldn't be in relationship with you. But notice how that way of, what that way of thinking does to that Pharisee. Notice that key phrase, standing by himself. Don't miss the significance of that. When we have to pretend to be superior to, morally superior to other people in order to feel loved by God and by ourselves, it becomes a really lonely way of living. We have to distance ourselves from God, from ourselves, and from others. We can't be like other people, so you can't just let your hair down and be an ordinary person. You can't fart like ordinary people. Farters are going to hell. Don't you know that? You can quote me. Put it on Facebook. You can't Lust like ordinary people do, not if you want God to love you. You can't doubt like ordinary people do if you want God to love you, if you want to be right with God. You can't get discouraged like ordinary people. You can't be selfish like ordinary people because if you're going to live up to God's standards, you've got to be a cut above. You've got to stand out. You can't be human if you want God to love you. Or at least that's what this Pharisee and many of us have always been taught. But then along came Jesus, light of the world, spiritual revolutionary, challenging us to dare to see in a whole new way, calling us to change our minds and adopt a whole new perspective on self and God. What was that new perspective Jesus was calling us to? It's illustrated by the second character in Jesus' parable, Luke 18, verse 13, but the tax collector, standing far off, as far away as he could from the pretenders, he would not even look up to heaven but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Then Jesus adds these critical words. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. Justified means right with God. So note, please, exactly what this tax collector did and did not do do to get right with God. He put all spiritual posturing and preening aside. He looked inside himself. He saw himself as he was, all of his shortcomings. And he honestly confessed his brokenness to God and to those who overheard his prayer. And notice please, what he did not do. Nowhere in his prayer does he promise to change his behavior. Probably because he intuitively sensed that that was a promise he could not make and keep. And yet, without any promises, just by being honest, he was justified. He simply, honestly confessed his brokenness to himself, God, and others and trusted in the mercy and grace of God. Be merciful to me, a sinner. He trusted in the mercy of God. Instead of believing in his own goodness, he chose to believe in the goodness of God. He chose to believe that God was good enough to love him just as he was. And that made him justified. 
in the presence of God. So that when Jesus launched his ministry in the words that we read at the outset of this sermon, when Jesus said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news. He wasn't saying, go out there and by sheer grit and effort, change your behavior. No, that would be an impossible ask. Instead, Jesus was saying, Change your mind. Learn to see in a whole new way. Instead of seeing myself as a spiritual pretender, as a model child of God, instead, I come to see myself as I am. Some good things, but a lot of brokenness. And instead of seeing God as being constantly angry with me because of my brokenness, I come to see God as able to love me just as I am. Lay down the heavy burden of constantly having to pretend. Remember the New Testament concept of repentance. It's not about behavior. It's about learning to see ourselves in a whole new way so that we no longer have to be pretenders. So why? Why do you pretend to be a perfect parent when there is no such thing as a perfect parent? Why do you feel the need to pretend there's no such thing as a perfect spouse? There's no such thing as a perfect child. There's no such thing as a perfect boss. There's no such thing as a perfect pastor. All of us stand before God if we're honest, broken, needing help. And here's here's the miracle. Here's the good news. When I begin to wrap my mind around that, when I begin to get honest with myself and get clear about God's grace and dare to embrace God's grace, it's then, finally, that I'm in a place where the grace of God can begin to change me, moving me forward step by step, inch by inch, two steps forward, one step backward. Gradually, God's grace over time begins to transform me, not because I have to, but because I want to, because of the love of God, the love of others, and because I have come to love myself. So, let's try to pull it all together now. I'll close with this. Years ago, Gordon McDonald was, was good friends with several folks who were in the addiction recovery process. He wanted to better understand their experience, so one of his friends invited him to go to uh, several open AA meetings with him. At one of those AA meetings, Gordon says uh, a, a new person came in, a woman named Kathy who, who looked to be middle-aged. It was clearly her first AA meeting. Gordon says to look at her, I could tell that as a young adult, she must have been Hollywood good looking, but now in middle age and struggling with alcoholism, her face was puffy, her eyes were red, her teeth were rotting, and her hair looked like it hadn't been washed or combed for weeks. Kathy was a mess. When it came Kathy's turn to speak, she said, I've been in five states over the past 30 days. I've slept under several bridges, been arrested, been raped, been robbed. By now she was weeping. I don't know what to do. I don't want to be homeless anymore. But I can't stop drinking. I can't stop. I can't. And she dissolved into tears. Sitting in the chair next to her, Gordon says, was a rather ample woman named Marilyn, 12 years into recovery. Marilyn reached over to Kathy as she dissolved in tears, put both arms around her and pulled her close so that Kathy's head was resting on Marilyn's chest. And then she whispered in Kathy's ear. Gordon overheard Marilyn whispering to Kathy, Honey, you're going to be okay. Okay. 
You're here with us now. We'll get through this together. You just keep coming here. You just keep coming here. You're going to be okay. Amazing grace. Kathy, and that story represents you and me in our various forms of brokenness, in our inability to reform ourselves. Marilyn, in that story, represents God. When we finally get honest with ourselves, God, and others, like Kathy in that story, it's then that God can pull us close and say, we'll get through this together. Just keep coming. Just keep coming to me. Just keep fellowshipping with me. And you'll get through this. You will be okay. So lay down your heavy burden. If you've been running from God, stop. There is no need. If you've been trying and failing, trying and failing to be perfect and full of guilt and shame, stop. There is no need. If you've been pretending to yourself, God and others, that you're perfect, trying to hold in all your bad impulses, trying to give the impression that you are a model of what a believer should be in consistency of standards of behavior, stop. There is no need. Release the pressure on yourself. The good news is that you don't have to pretend. You have been liberated from the need to pretend. There are no perfect parents. There are no perfect spouses. There are no perfect children, no perfect bosses, no perfect pastors. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be honest with yourself, God, and others. And then the miracle of grace begins its work. And we finally, little by little, bit by bit, find ourselves becoming more beautiful creatures than we ever could have been. Not because of self-effort, but because of the wonderful grace of God, the love of God that overwhelms us and enables us to love others and even love ourselves. That's good news. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lay down the heavy burden of self-reformation. Dare to believe in grace. Open your heart to it. Jesus calls you and me to a change of mind. Repent. Repent and believe the good news. Amen.